Um, next, we have the Deputy Mayor from the city, uh, for Innovation and the Modernization of uh, Public Administration, uh, Dr. Graça Fonseca, and he's going to talk about the strategy of innovation for Lisbon. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, all. First, just let me briefly thank you, the invitation to be here, and the privilege to be a partner of this initiative, Silicon Valley Camps to Lisbon. They asked me to accelerate my talk, so um, I had some images uh, that uh, I was supposed to uh, go through here. Just first one that maybe could, could be important to uh, situate Lisbon. Um, something that uh, usually people don't, don't think about it, don't, uh, maybe don't uh, reflect on what this means. Lisbon has a very strategic position in what concerns connecting several huge markets from three continents. And this is a very important issue when we are talking about competitiveness or entrepreneurship. So this is my first idea. Lisbon is a, a huge a strategic position in what concerns economy and competitiveness. I, I'm going through, through here rapidly. Lisbon this year uh, was awarded the best European city of the year. Uh, which uh, reflects the quality of life, which reflects the, the way projects happen in the city. And it, it was announced in London last week. I've just uh, returned from London today. And we are trying hard to put Lisbon in the network of global networks. I put here some ideas that we are trying to, uh, to push forward. Uh, this event is a good example of this new ambition. We want to put Lisbon in the global networks. We want to create, we want to attract, and particularly want to retain in Lisbon talents. All of you here uh, have talent, have ideas, have, have ways to create new things. What we want is that you create in Lisbon and you stay in Lisbon, and that you create uh, new products and new services for the Lisbon and the people who live here and study here and want to come here. Um, so what we want is Lisbon, a city to start up. Um, this is our main idea, um, and we are following through several projects. And we think that we have in Lisbon the three T's. We have talent, we have technology, and we are a very open and tolerant society. And these three T's are very important when we are talking about Silicon Valley, and when we are talking about entrepreneurship, when we are talking about competitiveness. So this is a strong idea um, that we, sh we, all sh we all should think about it when you think about Lisbon and when you think about what to do in our city. We have, as you know, um, Lisbon is a university city. We are the largest uh, city in what concerns universities in Portugal. And this is something very important for us, something very important for the city um, in what concerns the quality of the workforce we have here. We have a lot of uh, engineers um, and we have a lot of research centers established in Lisbon. What we are trying to do is to um, go forward and to um, promote the emerging ecosystem of incubation and exploration spaces. These are several images. You see there Betei, which was one of the organizers of this, uh, this meeting. And uh, we see ourselves as partners and we see ourselves as promoters of this ecosystem. We are launching uh, several projects. Um, talking about Startup Lisbon is a new incubation space that we will be opening till the end of the year in downtown uh, for new startups in the area of technology, design, whatever. Uh, we are also launching a new space for co-working, a uh, municipal space for co-working with a fab lab uh, which will be uh, connected to the incubation system and to the co-working space. We are promoting a lot of crowdsourcing. We have just uh, made um, an agreement with you know, Crowd. It's a startup uh, that launched a new platform and we launched a, a challenge that uh, now has been one to create a new network for social innovation in Lisbon. We want to connect everybody that is in this room and everybody that's outside to have a space where they can find good ideas, good, good places, good investment, everything that has to be with innovation. Finally, just a uh, final re remark, we are also um, launching this year a new hub with the open data for the creation of new, new services, new mobile applications um, concerning Lisbon and uh, the state. It's a national 
uh, platform uh, with the, the state. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you very much, Grasa, for that insight into Lisbon's startup uh, strategy. And next, we will have our keynote speaker, uh, Philip Rosedale, founder of Second Life, who is going to share with us some insights about what he's learned in his entrepreneurial career. Philip, welcome. So with, with only a little bit of time, uh, and we've only got a few minutes, so I'm going to change some of the things I was going to say. Hopefully I can uh, delight everybody with a couple of pictures and a couple of thoughts uh, while we're bringing this up. Uh, my own story, uh, and a bit of the story of Second Life. When I was, uh, got it, thank you. When I was a kid, uh, I was, um, I loved computers. Uh, my first computer was a Timex Sinclair, uh, and I started programming when I was in about the sixth grade. And as soon as I got involved with computers, I got so intrigued uh, by the idea of simulating, recreating the whole world inside a computer. And in particular, I was delighted by the idea that what would happen, uh, what, what would happen, to, what, would, what would a world be like that was built by all of us over again, starting from nothing in this empty, uh, you know, sort of virtual desert. And when the internet came around and everybody else was thinking about web pages and e-commerce, all I could think about was this idea that I couldn't get out of my head that I wanted to do that. There's something about entrepreneurship to be said in that because, and we've talked about it a bit here already, I was obsessed with the question of what that world would look like. I wasn't obsessed with making money. Uh, I, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't even obsessed with doing it well as a developer. I was just obsessed with the idea of what that place would look like. I couldn't get it out of my head. And so I started and became an entrepreneur uh, in that sense, not because uh, of a financial dream or a desire to change my career, but because of uh, that simple passion. And I think that has to be behind all entrepreneurship. We've talked a lot here in, in Lisbon about um, why people can, can be entrepreneurs or what the challenges are. And it brought me back to a story I'll, that I'll tell you, and it's probably about the only thing I'll have time to tell you, but I think it's quite interesting and connected to my own story. One of the things I did as a kid, uh, I actually uh, cut through the roof of my mom. I was living with my mom's house in San Diego, California. I cut through the roof because I insisted on making my door go up into the ceiling like Star Trek. You know, that was my idea of a cool way to do that. We live in California, I lived in California, they have earthquakes there, and when we cut through the roof of the house, you could see the ceiling sagging a little bit some of the time, and my mother would say like, well, th is there any risk in this, you know? Is there any risk in you cutting through the framing of the house in a place that has earthquakes all the time? Yes, there was risk in that. And what's more, uh, my mom, like, let me do that. You know, she encouraged me to do something so unusual. I certainly didn't know anybody else that had doors that went up into the ceiling. Much later on, uh, as when Second Life became pretty famous, I started traveling around the world. And one of the things I was interested in is this question that we've been talking about at this conference of entrepreneurship. Why do people in the United States and in Silicon Valley start all these companies that create all this software and all the value that's been created. Why is it that, why, and why, what is the unusual reason why we only do that for the most part there, statistically? Why is that? And I was, I was being interviewed by a person in Europe one time. I'm not going to give the country, <laughs> I'm not going to give the country where this interview happened, but I was being interviewed and the, the man was asking me about Second Life and he asked a simple question. He said, when you started Second Life, did you think it would work? And I thought, and I said to him, well, I always had a deep belief that somehow, someday, a virtual world that we would all be inside and doing business with each other and, and communicating would work. I had the deepest conviction that that certainly would happen someday. But I said to him, but I wasn't sure whether my company at that time would be the one to succeed in doing that. And even today, I can tell you that Second Life probably isn't, is, perhaps is the first stage of, of whatever happens there. And he looked at me 
and his eyes got a little bit wider, and he said, what did your parents think? <laughs> and in that moment, I understood everything. Because in that moment, it, it, I realized what I think is perhaps the highest impact thing about entrepreneurship, which is our parents have to start by encouraging us to take risks, to do things that are totally unusual, and that are, that are uh, to, to take on challenges that are different challenges than the ones they had, to get ourselves into situations and take business risks that are frankly unsafe. You know, where as a parent, you worry that your child is going to, you know, lose their job or, or, or become unpopular or, or, or fail in some spectacular uh, media-rich way. <laughs> and I think that that is one single thought about entrepreneurship um, that is really a takeaway and that, and that I was really struck by even here in talking about this, that, that, that you have to do that. So not only as parents do you have to support your kids in taking risks, but it's also a two-way street. To really have a culture of entrepreneurship, you kids that are being supported have to take those risks. We've already talked about it several times here, but you know, the, the, the greatest way to convince an investor that you're serious about what you're doing is to say to the investor, I'm out of work. You know, I, I've got nowhere to go. I, I, don't, I don't have any money. I, 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 don't, you know, I don't have anything to pay the rent. I've got to actually get this product built. That's the person that you want to invest in in Silicon Valley. And so that's a good sort of a summary thought. Um, and now I'm going to flash around a little bit because I've only got another minute or so. I'll show you. I was going to show you how to build software really fast. Yeah, exactly. I've got, I've got three minutes to show you how to build software really fast. How about this? This is kind of cool. Um, one of the, I, I love to do crazy things related to playing around with how things get done and how things are built. This little map I'll show you here, I'll just play it. Um, we did a very unusual thing. I did a new startup called Coffee and Power. It's a, we announced it a couple weeks ago with big media. It was financed uh, with a million dollars in venture capital, very standard Silicon Valley type of a thing. We built the company over about the last uh, three quarters. But in an experiment, and that's what this stuff is all about, right? In a grand experiment, we decided to build the entire startup using tiny bits of, of contribution, generally software work, done by about 250 people all around the world, some of them in Portugal. Uh, and, and you can actually see that the little size of the circles there is how much money uh, was being exchanged as we, as we as managers did little pieces of this job. So we built a big piece of software, a big sophisticated piece of software, Coffee and Power. You can use it now, coffeeandpower.com. Uh, using 288 people, 127 locations, and about 1,700 commits. Five or six times a day, we update our site with tiny little pieces of work that was done by one of these people around the world. That is an experiment, not just in, not, that is not just an entrepreneurial project, but it's actually a project that uh, seeks to redefine the very nature of work itself. In this whole project, which is a big software project, we spent about $200,000, which in Silicon Valley terms is like less than two people for one year, building this, this new system. And so uh, I guess the closing point that I'll make to wrap this up is that not only is entrepreneurship impactful, and it's going, I believe it's going to be increasingly impactful as we have more and more, more and more computers, a more and more globally connected workforce, there's going to be greater and greater challenges to take risks. Those who succeed will have to take bigger and bigger risks. But in addition to this, I think that the very nature of work itself, the very way that we work together, that which I think perhaps makes such, such a, is so striking as a cultural difference between, say, Portugal uh, and Silicon Valley, the very nature of work itself and how we work together is also going to undergo very considerable change just in the next few years. We're going to be uh, pushed by uh, technology that allows us to be more dynamic with our relationships, work with people for a couple of months instead of 10 years, uh, move jobs around between people in a way that's incredibly efficient. These types of techniques are going to allow us to fundamentally not only create new companies that create amazing new products, but do that in a way that looks completely different than anything we've seen today. And so I suppose uh, in summary, I can leave you with that thought that if you think the future, I guess as a, as a technologist from Silicon Valley, I'll leave you with the thought that if you think the future is strange today, it's, I think it's going to get a lot stranger than you think. So all of these things we're talking about really matter and get ready for it. Thank you. Thank you.